Thank you very much. So, what I'd like to tell you this evening is the story of how the most flagrant usurper in English history, since William the Conqueror, came to be king. We always think that, 40, that 1066, rather, was the last time in which England was invaded. Well, that's a moot point, but it was certainly invaded in 1485. And it was invaded by a man who had visited England once for two weeks. He was half Welsh, and he'd spent about half of the 28 years of his life in Brittany, in northern France. He was, to all intents and purposes, French, foreign. This man was Henry Earl of Richmond. He was a refugee, a chancer, and he was the man who was Father England's most notorious dynasty. This man was Henry VII. First slide, please. Henry. So picture the scene. It's a deserted beach in South Wales, Sunday the 7th of August, 1485. Seven ships appear off the coast of South Wales and they sail into Milford Haven, they drop anchor, and from the ships come boats shuttling backwards and forwards. They're dragging horses, armour, ammunition, munitions onto the beach. It's deserted, as I say. And in one of the boats, a knot of noblemen disembarks, wades through the surf. One man gets to the beach. One of these men, they get to the beach. A spare, tall man. And he sinks to the ground and he prays. He prays fervently. This man was Henry Earl of Richmond. And the thing is, this invasion was furtive, it was anxious. It consisted of only 2,000 men, many of them mercenaries. And this invasion was the, the most extraordinary convulsion, the latest convulsion, in the sequence of violent feuds and turf wars that had ripped England apart over the previous 30 years, and which would later come to be known as the Wars of the Roses. The, house of, the Red Rose of the House of Lancaster against the White Rose of York. And Henry's, really, is the most extraordinary story of all, of all. So, how did he come to be in this position? Well, we have to go back almost 30 years to January 1457. The clouds of civil war are gathering. And Henry is born in Pembroke Castle, just a few miles away from where he would eventually land 28 years later. He's the son of two prominent Lancastrian fa um, of two prominent Lancastrians two, from two very powerful Lancastrian families. His mother, Lady Margaret Beaufort, is merely 14 years old. Now that's a pretty early age to be giving birth, even at that time. And in fact, she was so badly damaged that she would never again have children. Uh, Henry's father, much older, was already dead. He died in a Yorkist prison. So. Henry has royal blood in his veins. He's a nobleman, as I say. He's the heir to the earldom of Richmond. But on both sides, it's irretrievably tainted. Lady Margaret Beaufort is from the Beauforts, a powerful Lancastrian family, descended from John of Gaunt, the great Duke of Lancaster. You know the, the Sceptre Dial speech, that's him. But he's had this family out of wedlock. He, his favourite mistress, Catherine Swinford, and although they're later married and the Beauforts are legitimised by Act of Parliament, they are also in the same Act of Parliament, banned from ever succeeding to the crown. On his father's side, it's even more dodgy because the Tudors are a, a very Arab East Welsh family. The young Henry's grand, grandfather, Owen Tudor, marries Catherine of Valois. Now, Catherine of Valois is the widow of the great Lancastrian king, Henry V, the, 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 uh, the great hero of Agincourt. And Owen, a very charming, very, very opportunist man, he marries her. He marries Catherine of Valois in this marriage that sends shockwaves through English society. But nevertheless, it is a marriage, they have children, and so they rise and they become, in the, in, the, in the Lancastrian reign of Henry VI, they become very powerful indeed. So on both sides, Henry has this royal blood. In fact, the young Henry is, is nephew to Henry VI, but via a mother, crucially. Via, he has French royal blood, not Lancastrian, Lancastrian royal blood on his, his father's side. So he's very much the Earl of Richmond. He's not thought of as somebody who is going to be heir to the throne. He's a long way down the pecking order. In 1461, the Yorkists claim the crown from Lancaster, and for the first decade of his life, Henry is brought up in, as a, as a, basically as an asset of a Yorkist noble. He lives a very quiet life in South Wales, and it's not until 1471, when the wars erupt again, that Henry's life changes. And in 1471, Edward IV, the great Yorkist king, 
exterminates the House of Lancaster. He kills Henry VI, who is still alive, murders him in the tower. He kills his son. He, he executes many prominent Lancastrian claimants to the throne. And Henry, Earl of Richmond, 14 years old, is the only Lancastrian hope left, despite this very tenuous claim. And his mother, Lady Margaret Beaufort, now in her late 20s, knows this, and so she sends him abroad. She sends him, she says, flee. He takes a boat from South Wales, and he flees to the... He flees to France, which is very sympathetic towards the Lancastrian course. But like a scene out of The Tempest, Henry gets blown off course, and he ends up in Brittany. And Brittany is an independent dukedom at this time. It has, it, it's very embattled. France is, is aggrandizing, powerful, the most powerful military power in Europe. And it's trying to conquer Brittany. But now, the Duke of Brittany has a pawn. He has this, this young Lancastrian noble who the Yorkists are desperate for. And this is where young Henry... He becomes a refugee for the next 12 years. He's somebody who, who is pushed from pillar to post. He, he spends long periods of time in, of, of boredom, punctuated by sudden alerts, punctuated by, by possible extradition, by possible assassination. He's moved from safe house to safe house. But at this point, again, he is still only a Lancastrian noble. But then suddenly, in 1483, everything changes. Next slide, please. Actually, next slide on. Because Edward IV, the Yorkist king, dies. Now, the Yorkists, at this point, they're set fair. Edward IV and his queen, Elizabeth Woodville, who herself is an Arabist, she's a commoner, she, she's not, Edward IV has shocked society again by marrying below him, and all her family, commoners, flock to court and, and lay their hands on, on, on rich titles, on, 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 on lots, of, lots of wealth. They get all the plum posts at court, etc. And... This has really annoyed another section of the Yorkist nobility. So, Edward IV has died. He's left a number of daughters and two young sons. And we know what happened next because, happens next because Edward IV's younger brother, Richard, hates the family of Edward IV's Queen Elizabeth Woodville. He fears that the Woodvilles are now going to control these two young boys, his own nephews, and so he locks them in the tower and they're never seen again. Richard, of course, becomes Richard III. He usurps, he usurps the throne. And the two boys are, of course, the princes in the tower. And it's at this point that the plotting starts. Rebels rise up against Richard III, but they have no figurehead because the two boys have disappeared. There are no more claimants. But there's one man in Brittany. And it's at this point that two women get together. Lady Margaret Beaufort, Henry's, Henry, Earl of Richmond's mother, and Elizabeth Woodville, the widow of the late King Edward IV, and who is, who is set against Richard III. And these two women plot. And what they say to each other is, my son, your eldest daughter. Lady Margaret Beaufort says, my son is a Lancastrian, Henry. He will marry your eldest daughter, Elizabeth of York. Put them together. We can unite England. These two warring dynasties can come together, and our, 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 our kids and their progeny can lead England into a, into a bright new bright new dawn. And so what we think of as the Wars of the Roses, Lancaster and York, it's the families of Beaufort and Woodville who uh, join together. And it's these two great, powerful political survivors, these two, these two great women, who are the catalysts for it. So in the, in the autumn of 1483, insurgencies flare across the south coast of England, and they're beaten. These rebels are beaten. They're put down by Richard III. He clamps down on them viciously. And what's left of them, they flee to Brittany. And they join the court of this fugitive, a man who, as Richard III said, has no manner of interest, right, or color in the English throne. He says he, Henry is descended of bastard blood, both on his mother's and his father's side. But at this point, the Duchy of Brittany is under threat as well. Henry, in fact, is, is more sought after than ever before, and Richard III is determined to extradite him. So he promises the embattled Brittany ships, men, material, money, and Henry is about to be extradited. He gets a tip off, and he flees to France. Now he's an asset of the French crown. So the situation is reversed. France proclaims Henry the rightful king of England. It lavishes promises of cash to fund his invasion of England. The threat of Brittany now, backed by English funds, is, is, is overwhelming, and the Bretons are about to invade France. But that threat subsides, ultimately. And as it subsides, because Richard III showers pardons and money at the rebels who have joined Henry, and he entices them back to court. They begin to leave Henry. They begin to flee back to England. And at the same time, France's promises dry up. Gallic shrug, no more money. And it's at this point that Henry realizes he either has to stick or he has to twist. His men are leaving him. 
It's August 1485. He tries to get money from wherever he can, and he recruits a battalion of demob mercenaries, French mercenaries, fresh from the, the, the wars between France and Flanders, and he says he, he hires them. And they set off these seven ships. So, in fact, when Henry arrives in South Wales in 1485, this is on a wing and a prayer. This is his last hope. It's not an invasion in which he expects to claim the throne. It's one where he has no choice. It's either that or fugitive begging around the courts of Europe for the rest of his life. And at this point, Henry encounters a war-weary England. This is a traumatized country which is exhausted by fighting. They don't want to fight on anybody's side, Richard's or Henry's. So as he ar arrives in Wales, which is, of course, his homeland, the support doesn't arrive. And he conducts a forced march all the way up the, the coast of Wales, and he heads for Lancashire and Cheshire. And these are the lands of his stepfather's family, the Stanleys. And the Stanleys are one of the most powerful noble families in England. They have a private army of something like 6,000 men. And Henry needs them if he's, going to, if he's going to take on the much bigger army of Richard III. So he goes to Lord Stanley and he says, we can do a deal here. You give me your troops, I will lavish, I will lavish titles and money on you and lands when I'm king of England. And Lord Stanley is an accomplished political trimmer. He hasn't survived the Wars of the Roses for nothing. He's tailored his coat according to every king's cloth. And he turns around to Henry and he says, I tell you what, we'll stick around. We'll follow you. Our armies will shadow yours as you move towards London, southeast, so into the southeast of England, and we'll see what happens. And that's all the promises that Henry has. And so he does go southeast. He goes, tries to pick up the Roman road towards London, and he's intercepted in the East Midlands by Richard III's army. He has to stand and fight. And this, of course, is the Battle of Bosworth. And on the 22nd of August, 1485, Dawn rises over the battlefield. Richard III's much larger army has assumed the high ground, strategically higher ground. Henry's army marches towards it. The vanguards lock at the base of this hill. The fighting is intense. But Richard III orders certain of his divisions to move forward and engage Henry's men, and they won't. Now, do they do so through disloyalty to Richard, or do they do so just because they're hedging their bets? Do they do so because possibly there's boggy ground between them and Henry's men? We don't know. But what happens is that Richard, from his vantage point on the hill, sees Henry hanging back from his vanguard. He's isolated with only his household knights around him. And Richard gets his cavalry together, and he, he's a very impulsive man, Richard. This is him. He's only 32 years of age. He's only four years older than Henry. He's a young man. And he decides that he's going to stake everything on this cavalry charge down the hill towards Henry. And these knights, hundreds of them, thunder down. They slam into Henry's household knights, and they fight. This is brutal, bloody fighting. The two are nose to nose. Henry's standard bearer right in front of him gets hacked down, and they can see the whites of each other's eyes. And it's at this point that the Stanleys decide what side their bread's buttered on. Richard's about to overwhelm Henry's men, and the Stanley men pile in. And one of Henry's mercenaries, one of Henry's first French mercenaries, hears Richard just before he's swept away, says, shouting, this day I will die as a king, or I will win. And he dies. And in fact, Henry is... Richard, sorry, Richard is battered to death so viciously that his, his, his helmet is driven into his skull. So we have to picture the scene at the end of Bosworth. It's a deserted battlefield. Henry's men are busily looting dead bodies. The crows are picking at them. Other bodies are being, cart are being, are being piled onto carts to send back for burial. And the Stanley, Lord Stanley wanders over to a thorn bush, and he takes the crown of England, and he places it on Henry VII's head. This is now Henry Earl of Richmond, this man who is a refugee, a chancellor, who's had no hope of being a king, nobody ever thought of him as, as being king, is now Henry VII. And now would come the hard part, which would be keeping the kingdom. Thank you very much. <laughs>